Hello, welcome to PCAP's Native Prairie Speaker Series. My name is Caitlin Morose, and I am the Stewardship Coordinator with Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan, or PCAP. Today, Joel Nicholson, Senior Wildlife Biologist with Alberta Environment and Parks, Fish and Wildlife Management, will be talking about Alberta's Greater Sage Grouse Recovery Program. Every month, PCAP asks someone to present either in the form of a webinar or an in-person talk in the Saskatchewan community on anything to do with native prairie conservation or species at risk. Don't miss our upcoming native prairie speaker series. We have on August 20th a webinar by Brett Campbell with Alberta Biodiversity Monitoring Institute, or ABMI, about mammal monitoring in Alberta. That's August 20th at noon, and it's a free webinar that you can watch from any location. If you are in the Valmarie area, check out our Native Prairie Speaker Series on July 18th. Shirley Bartz, Habitat Stewardship Coordinator with Nature Saskatchewan, will be talking about butcher birds and the stewards of Saskatchewan. Please visit the PCAP website for more information. I would like to take a moment to note that financial support for today's webinar is provided by our gold sponsors, Crescent Point Energy, Sask Energy, Sask Power, and Wildlife Habitat Canada. Our silver sponsors are Eco-Friendly Sask, as well as Environment and Climate Change Canada. In-kind support for today's webinar has been given by Joel Nicholson and the Alberta Environment Parks. Just a reminder to all of our listeners out there, if you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to type it into the question section of your webinar dashboard at any time during the presentation, and questions will be answered at the end of the webinar. And a bit about today's presenter, Joel Nicholson works for Alberta Environment and Parks as a senior wildlife biologist based in Medicine Hat. He has over 20 years experience working in the grasslands of southern Alberta on numerous species of wildlife, including greater sage grouse. So with that, I'd like to pass it over to Joel. Excellent. Thank you. Can everyone see the... Uh slide? Yes, looks perfect. Good to go. Okay. So I'm going to, uh, th first of all, thanks everyone for coming today. Uh, appreciate the, uh, the attention. And uh, today I'll be going over uh, our Sage Grouse Recovery Program in Alberta. Uh, it's a fairly active program that we've been running for, I mean, close to 20 years now in some way, shape, or form. Um, and uh, we'll focus a bit of the of the presentation today on our translocation, but I'll touch on a number of aspects of our uh, recovery program. So just a little bit of a review of biology of sage grouse. They are the largest species of grouse in North America. They're a sagebrush obligate. They require sagebrush for food and protective thermal cover. Sagebrush is 100% of their diet in the winter and they're uh, highly adapted to dealing with the toxins that are found in, in sagebrush. In the spring, they gather on dancing grounds, which are called leks, um, at, at dawn and also at dusk. Courtship displays that are so well known in the birding world. Females uh, come to the leks, breed with the males, um, and then uh, leave the site nest alone with chicks, mainly hatching in May and early June. So what presentation on sage grouse would be complete without a, a little bit of uh, sage grouse display? So this is a camera that we had up doing some monitoring at one of our leks in Alberta uh, a couple of years back and just uh, some Good footage we caught of one of the displaying males there. I'm not sure if the audio is going to work for this, but you'll at least be able to see the video of the displaying male. So they really are a spectacular bird, and this is one of the reasons why uh, 
they're so famous, people are so drawn to them. Um, but the other the other thing about sage grouse is they certainly have had their trials and tribulations. As an example, in Alberta, they historically occupied up to 49,000 square kilometers, uh, sort of focused in the southeast corner of Alberta. But uh, uh, historically, if one drew a line from the little town of Empress uh, on the Red Deer River to the north along the Saskatchewan border down towards Lethbridge, it was roughly the historic range of sage grouse. Their current range is less than 10% of historic range concentrated in the southeast corner of the province. Sage grouse are extremely sensitive to human disturbance. They avoid roads, power lines, noise, any structures on the landscape essentially that are taller than uh, sagebrush. There's a number of threats uh, that they've had to deal with. Uh, obviously, uh, habitat loss from energy development, uh, cropland conversion being a, another huge one, obviously, that pushed them down into the southeast in Alberta. And then uh, West Nile virus has been a, a recent threat. Uh, and then predation with changes in the abundance and uh, makeup of predators on the uh, prairies that is also uh, impacting them as well. Of note in this uh, slide here, the um, yellow line through the center is the international border and you can see the uh, lack of connectivity to habitat in Montana now with uh, cropland conversion in the area immediately south of uh, the Alberta uh, Saskatchewan border area in the corner. So another, another issue there with respect to uh, habitat fragmentation. If we're looking at sage growth um, conservation and, and, and trying to see what we need to do, probably need to look at a little bit bigger picture. And so looking at the northern sagebrush step, um, we can see with the yellow line being the international line, some of the uh, um, towns in southern Alberta and Saskatchewan are on there that are recognizable. Valmarie over um, near the National Park and many berries in Alberta. And then Malta and Glasgow in Montana. Um, you can see that our birds in Alberta and Saskatchewan were part of a bigger population. They're on the northern uh, extent of that range. And while historically there would have been ebbs and flows and good connectivity in the habitat, we've lost a lot of that connectivity. But we still are part of a larger population in the northern sagebrush steppe. Alberta sage grouse were documented being in decline in the 90s and the hunting season was closed in 1995. By 2000, they were actually listed under the Alberta Wildlife Act and the Federal Species at Risk Act. Our legislation requires production of a recovery plan. This was an agency-led process uh, which uh, essentially formed a team at a very local level in Alberta with representatives from ranching community, naturalists, fish and game, uh, oil and gas sector, and pertinent government agencies. Our first recovery plan was produced and uh, endorsed by the minister in December of 2005, and we moved forward with implementation of that. That plan expired. Uh, the decline of sage growth continued. Um, the team was reconvened and another plan was produced in 2013 and endorsed by our minister. That plan reflected the continuing urgency of the situation for sage grouse. Uh, there was a lot of research that had been conducted on sage grouse both in Canada and the United States. And uh, that additional science and information was incorporated into the new plan. The document focused on four main areas, improving habitat through restoration, reclamation, and acquisition, decreasing predation on sage grouse, promoting population recovery through translocations from other jurisdictions, and then also mentioned developing methods for captive rearing and release. One of the other things that happened during that time period was an emergency protection order was invoked in Alberta and Saskatchewan which uh, was done under the Species at Risk Act by the federal government. This was the first time that this uh, measure 
had been used in Canada and was essentially uh, intervention by the federal government in uh, management of provincial wildlife. This shows the urgency of the situation for sage groves. The EPO was actually based around lek locations and has various habitat restrictions on it. This is what it looks like on the landscape of southeastern Alberta. It focused on critical habitat on crown lands, has restrictions on noise development, and damage to native sagebrush. Certainly there were a number of uh, people that were unhappy with the situation. There's a local landowner group formed called Sustainable Canada that was essentially a product of the EPO. And then it made a very challenging uh, environment for oil and gas companies to operate in. And so the two main uh, companies that were active in the sage grouse area near many berries were the city of Medicine Hat and LGX Oil and Gas. So there's been some ongoing uh, growing pains there for those companies. So population and management of sage grouse, we historically had about 39 lac sites in the province that were known. At this point in time, we have three of those sites that are continuing to be active, kind of spread out from many berries to the southeast towards the Saskatchewan border. Try to monitor those sites um, four times every spring. Um, in 2019, we had a total of 24 males on our leks in Alberta, giving us a population estimate of uh, about 72 birds. We actually hit a low uh, in 2011 and 2012 of only 13 males and uh, had some recovery from that and have since declined. Um, this is the species possibly, you know, the most critically endangered in Canada. Um, it was very near uh, the, le the very near extirpation in a one to two year time period. This is what our population trend looks like. You can see the basically 2011, 2012 uh, time period when we hit our low. We began our translocations of birds um, in 2012, 2011, 2012. Essentially, um, the translocation was necessary or we felt was necessary for a number of reasons. Um, first of all, the population was at such a low level, we didn't think that it was potentially viable anymore. We were actually seeing uh, a number of leks um, going down to extremely no, low numbers and we were gonna lose, lose those leks without um, reinforcing the population. And we also um, know that we need time in order to uh, recover the habitat on the landscape. Additionally, advice from sage grouse managers in the United States was not to let your population go to the point of extirpation and be forced to do a reintroduction. It was thought that translocation into an existing population would actually allow the native birds and the translocated birds to integrate and uh, maybe uh, more successful than a reintroduction situation. So we engaged uh, Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks with a request to translocate birds. This went through their state game commission and uh, through their agency and was eventually approved as a pilot project for 2011. Um, due to inclement weather, we had to do the translocation of uh, 40 hens over two years in 2011 and 2012. We've also done translocations in 2016 and this spring in 2019. We have a proposal to uh, do another translocation in 2021, um, but that would have to go through the Game Commission for final approval again. So staff from um, Alberta Environment and Parks and Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks get together in Montana under the direction of the biologists in Montana and capture the birds using a night lighting protocol. The birds are monitored with uh, satellite GPS units for survival, nesting, uh, brood rearing, 
and winter habitat use. Well, essentially, once staff um, successfully capture a bird at night, it's brought to a central processing facility where uh, it's sampled for um, disease swabs, some blood, uh, feathers taken for DNA, and a certificate of animal health is uh, given to that uh, individual animal. It then goes on to a team that uh, transmitters the birds with these uh, GPS units. And so it is a rump mount attachment protocol. So essentially there are two uh, loops of Teflon that go around the bird's legs and the transmitter sits on the lower third of the back of the bird. You can see this unit has a solar panel on the back and also has a retrofitted VHF unit on the side. The VHF unit is used for uh, brood observation and for retrieval of the transmitters on mortalities. These units weigh about uh, 23 grams to start off and then have uh, an additional uh, three or four grams with the VHF unit. Birds are transmitted up to Canada, essentially in a padded cardboard box by a transport team. They're forced to go through the 24 hour uh, border crossing at Sweetgrass in order to um, be able to deal with uh, USDA permits and CFIA permits, as well as US Fish and Wildlife Service inspection. Once they're through the border there, another transport team in Alberta takes them to a release team the birds are moved into release boxes um, near an active lac site, and then they are released. Our pre previous protocol was that we would release the birds at dawn to displaying males. Uh, since that time with um, the uh, situation occurred with inclement weather and we decided to do an evening release, one of our staff decided to do that, and uh, we've moved to an evening release protocol just to reduce the amount of time that we have these birds in captivity. It's an, as you can imagine, it's an extremely stressful experience um, with birds um, being very agitated, um, very stressed out, um, handled, losing feathers. Uh, sometimes we even have um, eggs being laid in the box. And uh, we want to get the birds out of our um, out of captivity as quickly as possible. So we've actually moved to this evening release, which we did in 2019, that uh, kept the birds uh, essentially um, out of captivity for eight to 12 hours less. So we thought that was a very positive development uh, as we've refined our release techniques. So when the birds are released, they are essentially um, put close to a lek and the hope is that the birds will um, essentially fly to the lek to the displaying males, be attracted there, and then they would um, stay at that site, um, breed with the males and hopefully nest in the area. Now that doesn't always happen as uh, I'll show you, but uh, just thought I would show you one of our releases from this spring. And so in some cases, the releases go extremely well. The birds land right on the leks. Um, in other cases, uh, the birds tend to, you know, fly larger distances and not necessarily be attracted to the males. You can see this bird in flight with the um, solar powered GPS transmitter on its back. And as you saw in the, uh, in the video, it seems like, uh, the birds are able to cope with these transmitters uh, fairly well. We do know there's uh, some level of, of increased risk and mortality to the birds wearing these transmitters, but we do need to monitor the success of this program, and these are one of the most effective ways to do that. 
So with this particular transmitter, the data arrives daily at 7 a.m. via email. So the unit um, uploads data to a satellite, which then sends it back to a processing center, um, sends it to us via email. We process it with some software and it generates a KML file, which can be brought up in Google Earth and shows us the location of the birds um, for the last number of days. If it's working properly, um, we will get four locations per day on each bird. We look at those uh, at the data um, as frequently as possible, check the birds daily, and then the data is also mapped weekly by AEP staff on satellite imagery with a movement algorithm that's applied to it. And then those maps are sent out to staff in both jurisdictions in Al Alberta and Montana. So this technology has allowed us to get an insight into birds that we wouldn't have gotten with traditional telemetry. And so some of the movements that we have documented have been um, quite amazing. <clears throat> so if we look at this particular bird from back in 2012, it was uh, released. Uh, if you look at the grid where it says T3 range two, Township three range two, that's the site that the bird was released. It subsequently started doing these circular movements dipping down into Montana, going into Saskatchewan, went uh, through um, between the uh, west block and center block of the Cypress Hills in Saskatchewan, on the north side of the Cypress Hills in Alberta, back down to the Sweetgrass Hills in Montana, headed about 60 miles to the east along the Saskatchewan-Montana border, dipped into Montana again, and eventually came back to about 200, 300 meters from where we uh, released the bird in the initial uh, in the initial release over the course of a couple months, traveled over a thousand kilometers. So this was had had we had uh, traditional uh, VHF telemetry on this bird, we likely wouldn't have detected it for a couple months. Um, then we likely would have been looking for lost birds, detected the bird, thought that the radio transmitter had malfunctioned, and here the bird had been on this massive journey um, all over uh, two provinces and a state. So this we thought was our record. However, we've had some pretty big movements in 2019 as well. Um, here's an example of a bird that uh, was down south of the border. Um, moved north in about a three week time period and then decided to do a 245 kilometer journey over the next three weeks or so and moved uh, way out into Saskatchewan, certainly through some farmland areas and uh, will hopefully come back to Alberta, but it's definitely gone into some areas that would be inhospitable for sage grouse at this time. Um, this behavior is really risky. This bird, um, over the course of just about a month, we saw a 598 kilometer movement. North Dakota's sage grouse population has declined very significantly. In fact, they have less birds than we do in Alberta. And uh, I thought this bird was going to end up in North Dakota the way it was moving. Um, interestingly, if it would have actually turned south on about the 26th or 27th, it would have uh, been back to its uh, home capture lack a long time ago and, and would have been back where, where it came from. However, it looped back up into Saskatchewan and then uh, is headed back west. So. Um, this bird, I think, has done over 1,500 kilometers of total movement and will be the new record holder um, of translocated birds. You can see it's uh, getting back close to where it, uh, if it does head south, it could be back to its uh, capture lek at some point in time. We've never actually had a bird return back to its capture lek in Montana. Um, if this happens, it would be the first, but uh, amazing movements um, that these birds are capable of. We think of sage grouse as being, um, you know, 
not great flyers and not moving around all that much. Um, and uh, they are capable of uh, some amazing movements. As we know, the population in Saskatchewan is also seasonally migratory. And so uh, these birds are still surprising us, even though they've been um, researched for many, many years. This movement was particularly interesting to me, um, not just because of the huge distance, but also because of the area that the bird has actually um, gone into. Uh, just to orient you, um, you can see Medicine Hat at the top right there. So this bird was probably two thirds of the way to Lathbridge and moving through areas that probably haven't had sage grouse in them since the 20s or 30s. Um, and uh, very, again, very inhospitable, very risky behavior. And yet the bird actually has survived this movement and made it back to the sort of sage grouse habitat area in Alberta and is getting very close back to where it was released. Um, so the other issue with the birds doing these types of, of movements, aside from being very risky for them, is the fact that they're not stopping and nesting and producing young when they're making these types of movements. What we would rather see is something more similar to this bird where um, it is doing these exploratory movements around the habitat area, but then it does go back um, more near the lack site that it was released at, um, scouted out a nesting location during that time period. And then for the next uh, three week period, we basically are observing it on the nest and then uh, catching it on incubation breaks periodically. And so um, during that same three week period, this bird um, moved less than two kilometers based on our, uh, based on our transmitter. And so we do see birds that um, do settle down and do nest and do not exhibit these um, huge movements, but uh, there is a, a, a subsection of birds that, that are um, so stressed out and so disoriented that they do tend to make these uh, large movements. One thing I will also note um, with these movements, um, and we can see it um, with a number of the birds, is that these translocated hens are visiting inactive lek sites. So these are sites that haven't had birds on them sometimes for 20, 30 years. And uh, we will see that, you can see that sort of in the center of, uh, of the screen um, is very close to the LEC 0837. But uh, we, will, we will periodically get locations exactly on top of our LEC center GPS locations. And some birds have visited two or three or four of these inactive LECs right exactly where birds uh, used to be displaying. So there is something that these birds are queuing into and they do um, very regularly visit these inactive lac sites. So if we look at the movement patterns of these translocated sage grouse as Kayla Balderson did for her master's work in 2017, um, she looked at, at the movement rates of nesting and non-nesting birds and found about around a maybe a 10 week time period where um, the nesting birds, uh, their movement drops very quickly and they normalize within the area and then about a 10 week time period is when the non-nesting birds tend to drop those movements and normalize. So we should be in, in the fairly near future be seeing those birds doing these big movements, <clears throat> slowing that, those movements down, um, coming hopefully back into the release area, integrating with the local population and hopefully they will nest next year and uh, produce some birds for us if they can if they can survive. But there has been some analysis done on this. Kayla did a great job on the project for us and uh, her master's is available um, as well if, if people want to look at it in, in greater detail. This was only one small aspect of it. The other thing that you can see with, um, this is sort of a uh, better part of a month of data or so, but the three release sites, 99, 34, 68, 16, and 80, 30, you can see that a lot of the bird locations do coalesce around those leks. They are going back to those release leks a lot. So we are establishing fidelity to these lek sites um, with a number of the individuals and even some of the, the long traveling birds do come back to these leks where they were released. So um, 
it's not certainly not all bad news from a movement standpoint. We do sometimes focus on these spectacular long movements, but certainly not all the birds do that. From a mortality standpoint, um, we do have uh, temperature sensors and movement sensors within the transmitters that allow us to assess whether the bird is dead or whether it's nesting. Um, and we do uh, try to keep pretty close tabs on the birds. Our biggest source of mortality has been uh, great horned owls. So we started seeing a, a pattern of kill sites where we would find essentially a pile of feathers. We would find almost nothing left of the bird aside from the feathers. And we would find that the primary feathers were basically pulled out and often sheared off at the bases. Um, in consultation with raptor experts, essentially they said those are great horned owl kills. The owls will actually consume the entire bird, including the wings, but they pluck the, the feathers out of the wings. And what we're seeing is an owl having fed on this bird, uh, broke those feathers off with its beak, and then uh, consumed the entire bird. So that tends to be... Um, you know, very, very similar from kill to kill when we see that it's a great horned owl. When it's mammalian predator, um, you'll see different fragments. You won't see these same characteristic uh, sheared feathers. We have had some collisions with the tower. And then we've also, you know, we know that we've actually had West Nile virus outbreaks. We actually did have a positive bird last year. It wasn't one of our marked birds. It was a bird that one of uh, our biologists found when he was out checking another site that was freshly dead and it was cause of death was determined to be West Nile virus. So it is also possible that we're seeing West Nile virus deaths and then um, the uh, carcasses are being scavenged before we pick them up. We also monitor um, our nesting obviously and uh, try to determine the fate of the nest, whether it's been hatched or depredated by corvids, mammals, but it's very difficult to assess nest fates without video uh, surveillance on the nests. And we have uh, thought that it was too invasive and too risky for us to be trying to put video on every nest. So we do collect what data we can. And uh, in some cases we are able to determine what has depredated the nests, but in other cases, it's uh, just our best guess. So if we do look at mortality causes from our 2016 translocation, you can see the um, prevalence of owls in the um, mortality, where 15 of our, uh, of our mortalities were actually um, caused by owls. In fact, one snowy owl, which I think was the first uh, documented case of a snowy owl um, depredating uh, sage grouse. So, um, then we also have some mammalian predators, which um, often it's difficult for us to determine exactly what that is. Sometimes we're able to, but a lot of the time it's, um, it's unknown. But you can see the prevalence of great horned owls as our source of mortality of adult hens. From a survival standpoint, um, if we look at a year over year survival in 2016, we were sort of in, by the, by the end of the year, we were in the sort of mid forties, mid to high forties percent for survival. Um, and so not fantastic survival, but in translocated birds exhibiting um, these large movements and in a predator rich environment in Alberta, um, our survival actually has been reasonable. Um, the, Certainly the issue is getting the birds through that first year so that our nest initiation rates go up and, uh, and trying to increase our, uh, our nest success as well. So we have actually done some um, predator management. We focus that on the lack and nesting areas. We're really trying to make a long-term difference by removing predator subsidies off the landscape. And so this can be old barns or old rail cars that were used as sheds or old houses or um, in some cases uh, trees that were planted. Um, and so that essentially is providing um, food, shelter, nesting locations for predators that weren't there. So anything that's adding structure to the prairie is pretty much benefiting pred predators and to the detriment of sage groves. 
we do some localized direct removal. We are monitoring corvid populations in the area. But essentially, ravens and great horned owls are increasing on the prairie landscape. Um, certainly in the raven situation, I think that's across the Great Plains. And this is an issue that's been um, identified for sage grouse managers across the range of the species. And once again, um, if, if we can remove those subsidies, hopefully we can decrease the number of predators on the landscape in the long term and also decrease the chances of those predators interacting with sage grouse um, if we take those structures out of sage grouse habitat. I'm going to talk a bit more about um, our, our predator uh, management with uh, the removal of structures. Um, in a couple more slides, but I will just also mention there is a captive marine program underway, um, which is a federal and provincial collaboration that was supported by the environment ministers, uh, committed funding for about 10 years. Calgary Zoo staff are using uh, knowledge from a project in Colorado with Gunnison sage grouse. And this project should provide new knowledge to wildlife managers range wide uh, regarding captive rearing and also release. So the flock was actually established through the translocation, uh, the, basically started with the translocation uh, from birds that were laid, or sorry, from eggs that were laid um, in the boxes, as well as um, one nest that was, uh, was taken into captivity from a Montana hen. We've also had a couple of other um, egg collections from a nest in Alberta and also a project uh, done by the zoo in cooperation with Grasslands National Park in Saskatchewan. And so there is a, a flock that's established at the zoo. Um, the first captive release sage grouse uh, in Alberta occurred on October 3rd of 2018. And the zoo is um, monitoring the success of that project uh, in an ongoing fashion. And so um, let's see, I don't know if the sound's gonna work on this one, but you can see the initial release. So that's the first captive reared sage grouse. We're also working on land acquisition and restoration. And so this program focuses on marginal cropland or high quality native habitat. Um, it's generally done with a land purchase and then subsequent management of the properties. Public access is generally allowed. So some examples, since 2011, there's been a 2,371 acre block of land uh, purchased. A lot of that was restoration. That restoration is ongoing but has been quite successful. The ACA has been the lead on that one, done some great work there. We've had another parcel of 800 acres purchased with uh, also with an industry partnership. And then uh, recently a 2018 purchase of 160 acres uh, for restoration. Uh, I'll be talking a little bit more about that one in detail as an example as well. But these are generally NGO led efforts with government partnerships. And so groups like the Alberta Conservation Association, Nature Conservancy Canada, Alberta Fish and Game Association, Pheasants Forever um, have been involved with uh, funding and, um, and also implementing these, uh, these projects. So from a habitat restoration standpoint, um, I mentioned removing these anthropogenic uh, subsidies for predators. These, these structures are, um, being avoided by sage grouse. Um, they're also very predator rich and often very prey rich environment. So one of the things that um, came out in uh, Caleb Balderson's work was non-functioning habitat around these large building sites. Um, we've been working since uh, 2014, 2015 to remove a bunch of sites on both public and private land. Um, we did remove um, 12 buildings initially um, in 2014-2015 and then have been slowly working on additional projects including um, removal as recently as um, January of 2019 actually. I talked about these being very predator uh, rich environments so we have developed an assessment protocol to um, look at whether these sites are being used by predators, which predators, um, how many, and 
put up cameras at the site is one of the things that we do. And we can see that they're very attractive to um, predators, great horned owls being one of the one of the biggest ones. We can also see um, sometimes they attract people to go check these sites out as well. And, the, and there's just a, a lot of attractiveness to these old sites for a lot of different wildlife species. Um, so we do identify those structures and remove them. Uh, one of the other things we do at these sites is also conversion of fencing to a wildlife friendly standard or to the EPO standard. So you can see that picture of the fence there that has um, sage grouse markers on it to avoid collision as well as perch protectors on it, smooth wire top and bottom and the bottom wire is also at 18 inches which is also a side benefit for things like pronghorn and, and uh, other ungulates. We have also, as I mentioned, undertaken removal of large trees in critical habitat. And then the other thing to note is any new structures on the landscape also have to meet our land use guidelines or EPO restrictions. Um, so there's uh, definitely, uh, we don't wanna have new structures replace the old ones and have these same mechanisms at play. So just an example of one of these uh, acquisitions, uh, we found a, an opportunity to purchase uh, a chunk of cultivated land that was surrounded by sage grouse habitat about three kilometers from an active lek. Uh, there was a bit of native silver sage present on the site to um, seed it and then there were also some structures. So um, Nature Conservancy Canada stepped up and uh, ended up purchasing this, uh, this uh, particular property and also allowed the Calgary Zoo to put release pens on it for the release program. So we got a ton of value out of this site. We undertook our uh, structure assessment on it. Um, and uh, in order to justify, assess the, the predator use and justify the removal. And these are the kinds of things that we find when we start looking at these sites. We see uh, coyotes, we see prey species using them, attracting the predators. We have a weasel in the middle, that uh, poor picture with the, um, with the water on the lens of the camera is a badger. And then we see um, the weasel doing some special ops, hanging upside down from the roof, um, searching through that area for prey. And so we've seen this time and time again where we have these anthropogenic structures on the landscape that have very high prey density and that have very uh, high predator density. They're attracted there for um, food, shelter, nesting locations and uh, removing these off the landscape out of sage grouse habitat is hopefully gonna pay these long-term dividends. So um, the property underwent structure removal, fencing removal, some weed control and cover crop seeding in 2018, 2019. If you look at that little patch of sage behind the red fence post in the picture, that was actually where that rail car was that you just saw the pictures of. And we had a successful sage grouse nest from a translocated hen there. You can see the um, hatched out eggshells right in the uh, foreground of the picture on the perimeter of that property just in June of 2019. So, uh, you know, not, not saying that one equals the other, but it was very encouraging uh, when we saw that the birds are using this area, we've removed those structures and the property is on the path to restoration. So uh, very, very good project with a number of partners involved. The other thing that I will mention as part of our uh, recovery program is oil and gas reclamation that's been going on. So the companies that are working in that area, they're certainly aware of the fact that they're in sage grouse range and they are trying to um, focus and prioritize their reclamation. When I, I guess I should mention the city of Medicine Hat um, is largely leading that. And so they've uh, abandoned a number of sites that were in sensitive sage grouse uh, range. They're trying to eliminate their footprint in about uh, six sections of land that includes um, critical habitat, including wells, pipelines, and facilities. Um, the other company that was active in the area, LGX actually went into receivership and uh, due to uh, the low oil prices and downturn in the energy industry. And uh, 337 sites have been disclaimed to 
the Orphan Well Association, which is the agency that uh, deals with abandoned oil and gas sites when companies are no longer liquid. And so 234 of those sites are actually in Sage Grouse critical habitat. So one of the things that we have done is developed a prioritization tool. Um, this is a points-based tool that will prioritize the well sites for reclamation to provide the greatest net benefit for sage grouse and other species at risk. So we've just used a points-based system, uh, you know, critical habitat, distance selects, brood rain habitat, nesting locations, other species at risk, and pulled something together to provide to the Orphan Well Association uh, for these sites. And so we're hoping that we're actually going to see a surge of reclamation in sage grouse habitat that's done in very strategic fashion by the Orphan Well Association, and that this will actually um, speed up the benefits, I guess, and speed up the landscape restoration in some really key areas for sage grouse. So with that, I think I've provided a bit of an overview of our recovery program in Alberta, uh, showed some interesting bird movements, and uh, I would be happy to take any questions at this time. Thank you so much for that presentation. That was really, really informative. Um, just really interesting, all the techniques that, um, that you have planned and that you've accomplished so far, and really excellent results. Um, to all of our listeners out there, if you have any questions, please feel free to type it into the question section of the webinar dashboard. Uh, so Joel, there's a few questions here already. Um, from the beginning of your presentation, a uh, listener named Elaine was wondering if you were focusing on hens or the males for the translocation program? So uh, we had focused 100% on hens uh, for the translocation program, but when our population dropped to such a very low level, we did actually bring, uh, I believe, three males up that year. Unfortunately, um, none of those males survived more than one year. Um, so we have actually just, uh, and then we did see some population recovery. So we've actually been focusing just on hens. Um, I guess the other thing that I'll mention is these hens that we're bringing from Montana are almost sacrificial because where we're going to see our big benefit is the subsequent generations of birds. So if a few of them nest and are successful and raise some young, those birds are integrated into the local population. They're part of the population. And so we would anticipate a two or three year lag um, with, uh, with getting our dividends back from translocating these birds. Now, the thing that I think has also been hampering that is potentially West Nile virus, where we don't have a good monitoring program on it, but we do know it's been on the landscape. Um, and so that may actually be undermining some of our, uh, our translocation efforts by causing mortality events. The birds that we brought up in 2019 were actually tested for West Nile, and we found about a 10% uh, of the population showed exposure and had antibodies for West Nile. So perhaps sage grouse are starting to develop a little bit of immunity to it, but it is um, very, uh, very hard on sage grouse. Thank you for that answer. Um, a listener named Dennis is wondering if um, an older age class, um, like what age you focused on for translocated birds? So we do age the birds, uh, basically, um, we're able to do that with feathers and with um, some uh, morphometric measurements. Um, we can basically say whether they're juveniles or adults. Uh, there, there isn't really an opportunity to high grade the birds as it were and say, we're not going to take any juveniles, we're going to take all adults. Just because of the difficulty of capturing the birds and the amount of resources that we expend to do that and the amount of staff time that Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks devotes to it and, and we devote to it. Um, however, there has been some work evaluating juveniles versus adults that has found that juveniles are less successful in these translocations. So in a perfect world, we would probably try to um, high grade our birds as much as possible, but um, we're just happy to be getting the birds that we, that we can in any given year. And, uh, 
probably, you know, like I said, in a perfect world, we could be a little more successful if, if we did take all adult birds. And um, he was also wondering if, um, if it's older age class birds um, were exhibiting site fidelity and they were the ones that were like had those large distance movements and trying to essentially find their way home. Um, you know, I can't answer that question. Um, I don't think we've really done that analysis between whether it's um, juveniles or, or adults, but I do know that we certainly do have adult birds that have not exhibited those movements and have been very successful um, um, basically integrating into Alberta and, and uh, raising birds here. Okay, thank you. Um, one of our, or a couple of listeners are actually wondering how you can tell the difference um, if a sage grouse was predated upon by a snowy owl versus um, a great horned owl. Um, in that case, it was a direct observation of a snowy owl killing the bird. So um, if you only had prey remains, the characteristics would be the same. So we were just uh, lucky enough to see one of our staff saw um, a snowy owl on top of the sage grouse getting ready to consume it and it was freshly dead. So uh, that's why the snowy owl was put in there. Okay. Thank you for that answer. Um, a listener would like to know if you um, keep the grazing activity going on new recovery protected lands. Yeah, so all of the areas that are um, essentially that, that sage grouse area in the, in the southeast corner of the province is about 80% crown land, so owned by the government. All of that land is under grazing disposition, so there's uh, long-term grazing leases on it to various ranching operations. Our uh, public lands department has a range health assessment protocol that they do. So they do monitor grazing activities and, um, and try to ensure that we have a high level of range health occurring on those sites. But uh, we did not restrict grazing at all. And uh, latest research coming out of Montana is not suggesting that grazing is driving sage grouse decline for sure. If it's well managed, uh, the birds should be able to uh, do just fine in those areas. And in fact, there is some suggestion that long-term rest of sage grouse habitat will actually reduce its uh, suitability for sage grouse. Thank you. Uh, there are a couple listeners here who are wondering if um, when you remove uh, trees or, um, or human structures, are you considering the impact that might have on other species at risk, such as like frigidus hawks or barn swallows? Yeah, so we do not, uh, we, we don't move it, remove any um, trees if they have active nests in them or anything like that. Um, and certainly we have sites where we've got frigidus hawks nesting in trees and uh, we will obviously leave those trees um, in place and consider those species. One of the things that we have seen is people putting up artificial hawk platforms with good intentions but in sage grouse habitat and we now have basically an anthropogenic structure in habitat that's being occupied by um, fruginous hawks which are not a major predator of sage grouse but those sites also get used as perches for other species that are predators of sage grouse uh, year round outside the breeding season. So certainly we want to avoid those situations. And if we do have an inactive hawk platform in a, in a key spot for sage grouse, that would be something we would consider removing. As far as impacts to other species like barn swallows, we're talking about anthropogenic structures on the landscape. Sometimes they're used by them, sometimes they're not, but um, it's a pretty hard sell to me to suggest we should be leaving anthropogenic structures on a landscape when we're trying to turn it back into functional prairie habitat. Thank you for that answer. A uh, listener named Sarah was wondering if you could speak to the technical details of the VHF retrofit. Um, was it provided by the manufacturer and do sage grouse try to remove the, um, the transmitters or VHF retrofit? So um, 
we work with a company called GeoTrack, which um, has produced these rump mount uh, uh, solar GPS PTTs. Um, excellent company, excellent customer service. I'll give them a little plug here. Um, Keith Lesage is the fellow's name. Um, they developed the, the retrofit on there. The uh, VHF transmitter is actually produced by Hollow Hill, a Canadian company, sent down to the manufacturer in the US, and then they actually affix it to the, to the uh, GPS transmitter on the side, and also um, paint the entire uh, transmitter to resemble sage grouse feathers. So we have no evidence to suggest that the birds are trying to remove the harnesses. Um, we have had birds slip their harnesses, which was likely due to um, harnesses not being put on to the proper um, tightness. I've also had some birds slip their harnesses during incubation, which is likely due to a decline in body condition, and then the harness becomes, um, you know, more loose, and then the bird's able to get out of it. Um, as far as, you know, pulling the retrofit off, uh, it's put on with epoxy. It's extremely difficult to get off even with a pair of pliers. So um, I don't think that would uh, that would even be possible. Um, there's some work being done in the States by um, Pete Coates and others to assess the increase in mortality with the birds that occurs with these rump mount units. And uh, people are always sort of looking at them from uh, animal welfare, um, mortality standpoint because one of the things that is noticed is the solar panels are likely a little bit shiny and potentially easier to spot. Um, we've certainly seen that when we're looking for birds on nests and often we'll see that solar panel first. Um, but as far as the, you know, the use of the transmitter, we get a tremendous amount of data. We keep our presence on the landscape to a minimum. Um, and from a cost standpoint, the cost up front is high, but in the long run, hiring people to be out on the landscape and track them um, and pay their salaries and pay for trucks and gas and equipment, I think that um, you probably are spending about the same amount of money in the long run and getting uh, two or three or four times the data. And how long do you expect the translocations to um to work with the translocator, sorry, the actual device? Um, so we've had them last over three years. So at okay. a minimum, we expect to get um, two years and possibly up to four out of them. Okay, excellent. Thank you for that answer. Um, there's a question here from another listener. Um, is there an estimate on how much native habitat remains intact within Alberta? and that areas have no anthropogenic uh, activity on it? Um, I think that as far as within the sage grouse area, um, as I said, we were looking at close to 80% um, native habitat due to the fact that it's crown owned. Um, and then on top of that, we do have native habitat that is uh, privately owned as well, including um, some absolutely key parcels of sage grouse habitat. As far as a hard and fast number, I don't have that off the top of my head, but we do have um, a product in Alberta called the Grassland Vegetation Inventory, and uh, it maps out plant communities across the landscape and could be used to calculate particular um, amount of native habitat within an area. So that information would be available. I just don't have it off the top of my head. Thank you. Um, a listener named Charmaine would like to know if the translocation will have an impact upon the genetic diversity of the local population. That's a great question because I actually um, meant to mention one additional thing, and that is that we are going to do uh, an assessment of the success of the translocation using genetics. And so we have um, genetic samples and uh, genetic analysis of the population done pre-translocation. 
and we are also continuing to collect uh, feathers off of the lek sites. We're collecting um, feathers from the translocated birds, and we're also collecting all of our nest remains. So we would have, um, you know, some uh, DNA present on the allantoic membranes uh, from the eggs, um, and so we've got quite a little catalog of DNA samples that we've pulled together. We've partnered with the University of Lethbridge and there's a DNA lab there um, with Dr. Teresa Berg and they've actually got some funding and they're going to do some analysis to look at what our signature from the translocated birds is in the overall population at this time. So there's been some similar work that was done on Gunnison sage grouse um, with them moving birds from a large core population into some isolated subpopulations and they were able to determine an increase in genetic diversity and the genetic signatures from the main population in the subpopulation and we're going to do a similar analysis here in Alberta and uh, hopefully answer those questions as far as what what does our um, genetic diversity look like now with the addition of these Montana birds. So stay tuned for that over the next couple of years here. Thank you for that answer. Um, I think that's all the time that we have for, for questions today. So um, yeah, Joel, thank you so much for the really, really interesting presentation. I can't tell you how much I got out of it. It was just so fascinating to, to hear from someone with your knowledge and experience. Um, there's been a number of, of uh, probably about over 10 different listeners that have written in that have just said thank you. The presentation was really, really good. So on behalf of all the listeners today, thank you for taking the time to, to share this information with us. Oh, you're welcome. I appreciate people listening. And thank you to all of our listeners today for tuning in. Um, please feel free to check out the PCAP website for more information about our Native Prairie Speaker Series. And you're also welcome to... Um, we do have a one-minute quick survey that will pop up when you leave. If you don't mind filling that in, we really, really appreciate it. If you're, um, you can fill it in today or tomorrow, whenever. Um, that information helps us to report back to our sponsors so we can keep our Native Prairie Speaker Series going into the future. So with that, thank you very much, everyone, and have a great rest of your day.